And uh, first, I would like to thank the organizer and also Professor Castroneto for the invitation. And uh, Wang just gave a very comprehensive uh, talk on the theor theoretical side of these valley spins and the uh, pseudo spin physics in transition metal dichotinides. So my talk will largely echo what Wang talked about, but uh, from the experimental point of view. So hopefully it will be simpler to understand. And uh, here's the outline of my talk. The first part I will talk about optical manipulation of uh, uh, value pseudo spin and also value quantum coherence in transition metal dichotinides. And the second part I will show the demonstration of a strong coupling between spin value and the layer pseudo spins in bilayer transition metal dichotinides. And in the third part I will show you a little bit of device about uh, PN junctions made of monolayer and transition metal dichotinides. So let me just summarize what the one talk about. You know, for the first part, the spins and the value pseudo spins. So here's an analogy between electron spin and the value index. So for the electron spin, we know it has two states, right? Spin up and the spin down. It's uh, distinguished by the spin magnetic moment. So due to this uh, effect, we also we can have uh, this uh, spin hall effect, and if there's a uh, strong spin optical couplings, we can have these uh, optical selection rules associated with these spins, and. Uh, I hope one did a, a good job convincing you guys. For the valley pseudo spin, we have the same kind of a physics. Because for the pseudo spin, we have a valley minor moment. We can have a valley high effect. And then there will be also optical selection rules associ associated with valley index when certain material property, uh, a certain material property can be matched. So the key, the, the key physics we, we want to talk about here is Valley can be manipulated in the same way similar to the spins. And also the key physical quantity is a barrier curvature and also optical main moment. So for this talk, what's uh, important is these valley optical selection rules. So let me just emphasize it again. Because of this non-zero valley main moment, then we can have these optical selection rules associated with these plus k and minus k valleys. What it means is we can use uh, different polarization to adjust, selectively excite different uh, valleys. So for example, for the plus k value, we can use a scale minus light to address it. And then for the minus k value, we can use a scale minus light to address it. So this will be kind of a main topic and the cover for the first part of my talk. So now, um, we first we talk about what uh, the materials can be used to realize these uh, value physics. One cover a little bit. And uh, turn, it turns out uh, group six transition metal dichotinides actually is a, a ideal platform to demonstrate these value physics. And the, the dichotinides, you know, back to 2005, the Manchester team already demonstrated, uh, used this mechanical exfoliation technique. There's a variety of two dimensional material we can get. So one of them is uh, MOS2. And uh, here, let me just show you the example we, we have from a lab. The top is an uh, optical microscope image of these. Uh, uh, Thin field MOSE2. So I want to show you there's a model layer, two layer, and a tri layer. We can just tell the layer thickness by the uh, optical contrast. The bottom one is the atomic force microscope image. So if we take a line cut, we can tell each layer is about the seven angstroms. So the breakthrough happened about uh, two years ago. And Tony Hans group and also from one group, they show at the model layer limit, these transition metal dichotinides become a direct band semiconductor. So the bottom left uh, figure is the uh, main experimental evidence. This is uh, a photoluminescence measurement on a single layer and a bilayer MOS2. So the, the experiment shows for a monolayer MOS2, the photoluminescence is about a two orders magnitude larger than bilayer. So this is you know, sort of con kind of intuitive, right? One layer, two layer. I mean, two layer has a double material, but actually luminescence is much, much smaller. And this is uh, a evidence of uh, uh, the electronic structure transition from bilayer to single layer from indirect to direct band gap semiconductors. So this is very interesting to me as an optical um, experimentalist because what it shows we have these uh, direct band semiconductor in a two-dimensional limit. What it means is all the physics we talked about before with this Galen arsenide quasi 2D system, we have a chance to revisit some physics there. And also this morning, and Professor Kiss also talked about, you know, for these two-dimensional semiconductor, there's a kind of a very interesting potentials for device physics. Then we look at the, the, the lattice structures. As Juan mentioned, if we look from the top, for these monolayer transition metal dichotinides, they also have this hexagonal lattice structure. And uh, non-light graphings 
Here, these two AB lattice, the symmetry breaks because one is metal, the other is, uh, the, the other is cogenized. So then, in this case, the valid physics we talk about, which is one is a barrier curvature, the other is magnetic moment, they are not a zero anymore. It means all these valid physics, they, they, they can, they, we can basically probe these, these valid physics. So, because of this non zero magnetic moment, M here, which is, a, you know, sorry about, which is important. And uh, here I show you, sorry about. It. So here what I show you is now we have these uh, two inequivalent values, plus k and minus k. And uh, these two values, they can be probed, they can be selectively addressed by circularly polarized light. The first thing I would like to show you is, for a real electron spin, we know we can use optical way to initialize it. means we can optically generate spin up states or spin down states. Then the question I want to address is, whether we can do the same thing for this valley pseudo spin, basically generate valley polarizations. So there's a three beautiful work that demonstrate this valley polarization in monolayer and MOS2. And here I'm going to show you the example we have from monolayer tungsten selenide. And uh, for, for the fundamental optical excitation in semiconductors, this elementary excitation is excitons, which is electron hole pair bounded by cool interactions. So for two-dimensional system, there's a three type, basically it's two type. One is neutral exciton, is bounded together by one electron and one hole. There's also charge exciton. For charge exciton, one kind is negatively charged exciton, means there's two electrons and one hole. The second one is positively charged exciton, and two hole and one electrons. So we have x0, neutral, x minus, and x plus. These are two charge excitons. And the first thing we did is we we look at the luminescence from monolayer tungsten selenide. And uh, basically, we shine a light on the sample, and uh, we collect the luminescence and uh, look at the spectra for a spectrometer. So the red curve here I show you is the PL coming from monolayer tungsten selenide. What we notice is there's two very sharp lines. And the one is neutral exciton, the other corresponding to the trions. So how do we know? And, uh, in, in semiconductor, you know, in gallium isolate uh, um, community, um, what, uh, what we can do is we, we, we check this uh, luminescence of the excitons as function of carrier densities. So the advantage we have here for monolayer system is because the monolayer is so thin, so it's very easy to control the carrier density by a gated electric field. So this is what we do. We fabricate a monolayer uh, field effect transistor. Then we look at luminescence as function of the carrier densities. It, uh, this is uh, the PL intensity plot as function of photon energy. This is the x-axis, and also the y-axis is the gate voltage. So, simply, the plus gate voltage corresponding to inject electron in the system, and then the minus gate voltage corresponding to inject hole in the system. Let's first, let's, let me walk you, walk you through this map. So, let's focus on this uh, zero gate region first, means the sample almost intrinsic. Then we see a sharp line here. This feature corresponding to neutral exciton. And you can see this, this neutral exciton almost, you know, symmetric with respect, with respect to this zero gate voltage. Means this sample is kind of very clean. The, the thermal level is uh, almost near the, near the middle gap. Then if we inject electron in the system, so what's happening is this neutral exciton will catch the actual electrons to form a lower energy trion state. So in this case, it's a negatively charged trion. So we observe actually there's two types of negatively charged triumphs. In the same thing, if we dope it with holes, then the electron hole that catch a extra hole will form a positively charged exciton, X plus. And as we show here, this is the X plus. So now we can see we have actually a remarkable system, right? It is really simple. We can just tune the carrier density and we can selectively to control what exciton we need. This is a Compared to a gallium system, this is very easy to do because you know, gallium arsenide is really bulky. It's kind of a, uh, difficult to control carrier densities in situ. And uh, we also did the wide light reflection measurements, so you can understand these as just absorption measurements because we know in a PL sometimes even you see a state that may be not a real state. So by these uh, reflection measurements, we compare these two maps. We can clearly tell all the states actually there in the absorption spectra. So now we can comfortably say we, can, we really have all these uh, excitonic states, means triumphs and neutral excitons. Can I ask you, what, what's, what's that feature around 1.6 electron volts? 
Which one? This one? Yeah, up there. Yeah. Yeah. So this uh, is a complex feature coming. There's a mixture of a bound, um, impurity bounded exciton and also phone num set bands. So the so the sharp line here uh, we believe is a phone num set band. And there's a broad feature here corresponding to the impurity bounded states. Okay. So now I'm going to talk to you through how to demonstrate these valid polarizations. So let's walk through this model. The model tells us um, we have a valid optical selection rules. For a plus k valley, we have, uh, for example, a sigma plus polarized. And uh, for the minus k, minus k valley, which is sigma minus polarized. So let's assume we're sending sigma plus polarized light. So we excite electron hole in plus k valley. Then this electron hole, they're going to relax to the band edge. They form exciton. Then they recombine, emitting light. Because this intervalley scattering is uh, strongly suppressed due to the momentum separation between these two valleys, means in this whole process, the electron hole, they're going to stay in this plus k valley. So when they emit a light, the polarization of the light will be similar as the incoming light. It means they will also sigma plus polarized. So experimentally, what we do is we do polarization resolve the PO. means we look at the polarization component of the PO, and then, then we can tell what's the polarization of the emitted photons. So here's an example. We're sending a sigma plus polarized light to excite the sample, and then we collect the PO represented by this black curve here. Then we also look at what is the sigma minus component. We look, OK, this is a red curve here. So you can clearly see the sigma plus component is much stronger than the sigma minus component. So we have a polarized luminescence, and then the polarization is the same as incoming photons. So this is a signature of valid polarization. And also, we can send in sigma minus polarized light, and we can adjust the other value excitons. And we can also combine the gate voltage. Then we can selectively adjust different kind of value excitons. Basically, we can adjust you know, neutral exciton, x minus, and x plus. Okay. So now we have all series of uh, value excitons. And now, uh, I hope I convince you by this optical pumping technique, we can generate a value polarization. Then here's another question. If we do analogy between electron spin and the valley pseudo spins, okay? We know for electron spins, we, have a, we can have a spin up and spin down. These are the coherent superposition states. Then a question arises whether we can have this uh, coherent superposition between valley pseudo spin. Then this will represent intervalley coherence. So this is a coherence between two states in the momentum space. This will be different from the coherence of these two electron spins because they are, they, are, they are in the same momentum space, but they have different uh, up, I mean, opposite of by the moment. So let me just remind you what I show you, right? For the valley polarization demonstration, I show you all the four states, neutral exciton, x minus, x minus prime, and x plus. They are polarized. Now I give you a contrast. Here I send in linearly polarized light. Okay? For linearly polarized light, then I look at the polarization result of the PO. So basically I look at the PO and on the for this particular case, I send in horizontal porous excitation and look at the, the horizontal component and also vertically porous component in the PO. And you can see clearly, only neutral exciton is polarized. And all the other trial states, they are not polarized. So let me first walk you through what is this neutral exciton means. So for the neutral exciton, what I show you here is I have uh, this polar plot. means I plot the PO intensity of neutral exciton as a function of detection angles. And then in the center, this red arrow shows the polarization of incoming light. And uh, for this polar plot, you know, the, 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 the polar axis basically indicates the polarization of uh, emitted photons. And you can clearly see the, the polarization of emitted photon it has the same polarization as incoming excitation photons. So I start to rotate the, the excitation the polarization of excitation photons, and you can see that the PL polarization also rotates, basically follow the incoming photons. And then we can also look at the, the degree of polarization. Here, the red square shows the degree of polarization. You can see the degree of linear polarization has nothing to do with the uh, polarization of the incident photons. So this means the degree of polarization has nothing to do with crystal orientations, this as a topic. So linear polarization you know, has been observed in, in semiconductor systems. There's two explanations. The first one is due to the anisotropy of the material system. For example, if you 
have a certain axis brick symmetry, you, you have chance to get a linear polarization. So this is clearly not the case, right? The second interpretation is it generates the in, uh, axitonic coherence. So when the coherence time is longer than the axiton recombina recombination time, then we can observe linear polarization. So this is the interpretation of our data. So what's happening here is I show you for linearly polarized, I mean, for these valley axitons, they have these uh, circularly polarized optical selection rules. One is C1 plus, the other is C1 minus. Then linearly polarized light is a coherent superposition between C1 plus and C1 minus. Then when we send in this linearly polarized light, they excite these both plus K and the minus K valley axitons. We create this exotonic valley coherence. Then this valley coherence actually remains during this axiton recombination process. Then the emitted photon also will be linearly polarized. So this is a, the, the, the preservation of this linear polarization is a evidence we generate of this uh, um, axitonic valley coherence. Now the question arises why we cannot, the, why this uh, charge axon doesn't have this uh, linear polarization? Be because I told you, right, for the charge axon also have a, these uh, circularly polarized selection rules. So the explanation is here. Now we look at the X plus, this is a simpler case. For X plus, there's only two type of uh, um, charge axon because like two, two whole spin has to localize the into different valleys. And then, depends on where this electron spin is, we have a two different X plus. F when the electron spin in a plastic valley, and this charge X time will emit a sigma plus light. And then, will leave a whole spin down. This is the final state. Then for the other configuration, when this electron hole recombine emit a sigma minus light, we have a whole spin up. This is the final eigenstates. So you can see these two final eigenstates. One is spinning down, the other spinning up. They are orthogonal to each other. So if we write it out, what it means is we have a sigma plus light with whole spin down plus a sigma minus light with whole spin up. So this is spin photon entanglement state. So we cannot get linearly polarized light. Okay, let me just uh, um, give a quick summary of the first part of my talk. And uh, we do analogy between valley pseudo spin and the real electron spin. So we can use a block surface to represent this analogy. In the north pole, it represents a plus k valley pointing the, ve the block vector pointing up. So in the, in the south pole, we when the block vector you know, pointing down represents, we generate the valley polarization minus k. So when we send in sigma plus light, basically we generate a pseudo spin pointing up. When we send in a sigma minus light, we join a pseudo spin pointing down. If we send in a linearly porous light, it means we can generate a pseudo spin pointing to the equator. So we create a coherent superposition between spin up, pseudo spin up, and a pseudo spin down. So in principle, if we can send in ellipti elliptically porous light, we can generate a pseudo spin pointing to uh, to kind of any point in this block surface. Okay. So second part of my talk, I will show you the coupling between spin and the pseudo spins. So we know here, the first example is very simple I want to give you is for real electron spin, which is, has this minor moment. We know when this electron spin coupling to this motional degree of freedom, we have this uh, spin orbital coupling effect. And as one talked to you, for this model layer transition metal dichotinides, actually there's a very strong valley and the pseudo spin, valley and um, valley pseudo spin and a real electron spin coupling. So this is spin valley coupling effect. What if we go by there? So in the by layers, we have a, here I'll give you an example, right? We have a up layer and a bottom layer. When the electron in the up layer, we can think of a pseudo spin pointing up. And when the electron in the bottom layer, we have a pseudo spin pointing down. So this layer pseudo spin corresponding to electrical polarizations. Now let's go to this uh, by layer with AB stacking. So in the bilayer system, when it's AB stacking, means uh, you know, the, the plane, the bottom plane is 180 degree rotation of the top plane. So when this happens in the real space, when there's 180 degree rotation, means in the momentum space, there are also 180 degree rotations. So in this case, the spin valley and the layer pseudo spin actually couple each other, okay? So let's look at the, this particular valley, plus K. You can look at the top valence band for the, for the top layer, the whole spin is pointing up. Then for the bottom layer of a top valence band, actually, the whole spin is pointing down. So it means, this is just an example, right? The real electron spin actually locked to the layer pseudo spins, okay? So, um, 
I will just give you a conclusion since we already talked about the detailed theory of this uh, um, layer pseudo spin and the spin coupling effect. So in a condition when this uh, spin orbital coupling is much larger than the interlayer hopping strength, then the real electron spin will lock to the real lock to this uh, layer pseudo spin. So here I give you an example. When this valley index is fixed, then the spin index will also will basically will lock to the layer pseudo spin. So in this case, the spin whole spin down will localize in the up layer, and the whole spin up will localize in the bottom layer. And uh, when this spin and the layer pseudo spin coupling exist, what do we what we can see is if we want to flip this uh, whole spin from down to up, we have to flip this layer pseudo spin. So this flip, this, um, this kind of a spin flipping process is strongly suppressed, which means is we expect a long spin relaxation time. Okay? And the second effect is because I show you, right, this layer pseudo spin is electrical polarization, means if I apply electric fields, Perpendicular to the plane means our electric fields will break the energy degeneracy between layer, layer pseudo spins. Now, I show you these electrons, either electron hole spin actually they couple to a layer pseudo spin, means the energy degeneracy between spin up and the spin down also breaks, right? Follow the layer pseudo spins. So, what we expect is the electric field now actually will control the spin Z1 splittings. Because this electron and the hole wave function are slightly different, then you can think of the G factor, you know, the coupling factor is different to the electric field. The, the, the Z-man splitting will be slightly different for the electron and the, for the conduction band and for the valence band. The result is we're going to see two different transitions, omega-1 and omega-2. These two transitions will have different energies. This energy difference corresponding to the Z-man splitting difference of conduction band and valence band. And I uh, also just show the line cuts from you know, three different gates. I show you at the zero gate voltage, we have a neutral exciton, which is kind of tiny, and we have a also negatively charged triumphs. And uh, at the positive gate, we only have x minus, and for the negative gate, we only have x plus. Okay. Interesting happens when I do these gate-dependent uh, polarization measurements. The first thing I did is I uh, send in linear polarized light, and I uh, look at polarization result the PL as I did for a single layer. Now you can see there's a very large linear polar. I mean. Sorry, very large circular polarization. The degree of polarization actually even larger than in the single layer case. And uh, we did a gate dependent measurements. So here I'm plotting the degree of polarization as a function of gate voltage. So you can see there's a little bit of gate dependence. Now let's first look at the, the polarization at the zero gate. The degree of polarization is very large, about 70%. And we know for the bilayer case, right, because inversion symmetry restores at the zero gate voltage. We, we don't expect uh, any significant value polarizations, okay? But we still see this large polarization. This large polarization are actually coming from the spins, right? Because when I send in sigma plus light, I can excite the whole spin up in both plus k value and the minus k value. Because this whole spin is locked to the layer pseudo spin, as I just showed you, and this whole spin should have a really long relaxation time, then the PO should be strongly polarized. So the observation of this uh, strong PO polarization actually is an indication we have these uh, spin layer locking effects. Now, actually, there's more, there's more we can do. We turn up the gate voltage, basically, to, rate to 150 volt here. So we can see now these charm states, not only one anymore, actually splits into two. Okay? Here's two states. One is omega 1, this is omega 2. And these two states have different response to, to the polarization of light. And this, the, this, and the splitting between these two states uh, is, ha is a gate dependent. So this is a signature of electric field generation of a spin z man splittings. Now we look at the linear polarization dependent uh, PO. Uh, it's even more interesting. First thing we do, first thing we see is with linear polarized light, now we, for the trans states, we have linear polarization. Remember, for the single layer, for the trans states, we don't have linear polarization, okay? And uh, we look at this, we also did the same measurements. We rotate the, the incident photon polarization, and then we look at the polarization of the emitter PL. You know, the same plots basically shows we use linearly polarized light to generate a isotonic coherence in the systems. And uh, this is just a reminder. 
for charm states in a single layer case, for the charm states, they are not polarized. But here, for the bilayer case, we can see even with linear polarization, there's a strong polarization coming. Now, when I do gate dependence, of course, I will see the state splits into two states, and the splitting with linear polarization measurements agrees with the circular polarization measurements. But what's more interesting is these two states, omega one, these two states, the split of two states has a very distinguished uh, response to the linear polarization excitations. So let me just show you one data point at the 150 volt. First, you know, we send the linearly polarized like vertical polarized, and then we look at the, the vertically polarized PL. Okay, and we see two states, omega one and omega two. Then we can do the fitting of this data. Basically, we extract the linear polarization component of these two peaks, omega one, omega one and omega two. Then we look at the, what is the horizontal component of this PL, represented by these red data points here. Now you can clearly see, right? The horizontal component of this omega two actually equal to the horizontal the vertical component means this, this, two, this omega two states actually doesn't have linear polarizations. So linear polarization only coming from omega one, but not from omega two. So this is very interesting. Let me show you what it means here. Okay. Excuse me. Uh -huh. but it seems that you have a third peak there, right? Where? Uh, below the. Uh, you mean here? Yeah. No. Yeah, in the middle there. Here? Yes. Yeah, I don't know if this is real. Actually, well, what's going on there? Not sure. I think this sort of peak is coming sort of the SA imperial states coming from here. You can see this wiggle. Yeah, it's not polarized. So this is the main feature for the trans states we know for sure. Yeah. Okay. So I show you this uh, two omega one and omega two, two states. Actually, we can map them in in, in the you know exotonic sta states. So for omega one. For, let's look at omega two. This is lower energy transition. It has to come from this uh, configuration. So basically, what I mean is, for the excited electron the hole with this actual electron, they have to be in the same layer. In this case, they are in the lower layer. So here's what I mean. You know, this is a intralayer triangle. Means all three particles are localized in one layer. Now you can see this intralayer case is exactly the same as the monolayer case, right? You can just think of these monolayer triangles. So they not linearly polarized. However, for the omega-1 transition, what's happening is, because omega-1 is high energy, so this photo excited electron hole has to be corresponding to this transition here, means in the upper layer. So in this case, the electron hole, the photo excited electron hole actually in the opposite layer of these actual electrons, means this is a interlayer trions, okay? So three particles are localized in different layers. Now with these interlayer trions, the the what we have what we have here is uh, the, the the exchange interactions are strongly suppressed because these three particles are localized in different layers. Now the linear polarization or the valley coherence can be allowed. So this this is what we see here. Means for this bilayer system, we have this uh, spectroscopy evidence of these interlayer and the intralayer trails by creating this uh, valley coherence. So the third part of my talk is I want to talk a bit a little about the uh, sort of device, I mean, it's a very simple one. It's monolayer PN junctions. So we know for this monolayer semiconductor, a, a challenge is to create a good context, okay? So this is sort of a motivation of our work at the beginning. And uh, what we do is, we, we, we borrow the idea from the graphenes. We, we use boron nitride as a dielectric layer, and underneath boron nitride, we create a, a, a to maintain like a bottom gates, so we can then we, we transfer a monolayer tungsten cyanide on top. So in this case, now these two split the bottom gates, they can control the carrier densities above it, so we can create a PN junction. So the, the idea we use here is you can see that the metal contacts connecting these uh, tungsten cyanide actually sitting on top of the bottom gates. So we, we're hoping, you know, use a little bit of screening effects, we can create actually good, we can erase this shocky barrier effect, and then we can create a good contact. So this idea works, but not perfect. And this is the image of the device we have. So we have a, this, this is a monolayer tungsten cyanide, and we, we, we just pattern many bottom gates, and uh, we, we first transfer boron nitride on top, then we transfer tungsten cyanide, then we just pattern electrodes on top. 
Let me first show you the electronic property of this device. And the first thing we did is we set these two bottom gates to the same voltage, then we sweep them together, then we measure the current as function of gate voltage. So we can see, actually, we can inject electrons or inject the holes into the system. So we can realize these ambipolar injections at the low temperature, 60 Kelvin. So th this is, a, we are pretty happy about this data, even though it's still not uh, the perfect contact, but at least we realize the efficient injection of electron holes simultaneously at a low temperature. Now, we can set these two gate voltage to opposite values. So these the blue curve shows the IV measurements. And when these two gate, one is a plus eight volt, the other is minus eight volt. So now we create a PN junction. This is just ideal, you know, doubt feature. Then we, we then we can use the optoelectronic method to test uh, the property of these PN junctions. And this is optical microscope image of one device. And uh, the second image, the color image I'm showing you here is a scanning photocurrent image. Basically, I shine a light across the sample. At each point, I measure the photocurrent. Then it's not surprising, right? Because the PN junction, there's a huge potential drop. Then we create a very strong photocurrent response. And then we can also use this uh, spatial resolved photoluminescence to map out these PN junctions. So this bottom left figure here shows the luminescence map as function the position. Then to from here, you know, we cannot tell much. But if we plot the luminescence energies, we can clearly see there's two regimes, one corresponding to negatively charged triangle, the other corresponding to a positively charged triangle because it's PN junctions. Here, just to show you the three spatially selective the field spectra, the top one is from the M regime, so we see X minus. The bottom one is from the P regime, we see X plus. And uh, the black curve I show you from the PN junctions. So we can see all three features, X minus, X plus, and X naught, because there's a, there's a potential drop right from the P to N. So we see three features together. And uh, one thing we'd like to do is when we show you by sending in light, we can look at the luminescence coming out. So this is a photo generated light. So we want to see if we can inject current and look at luminescence. So these are electroluminescence measurements. Electroluminescence has been demonstrated in MOS2. But the, 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 in these previous works, what they did is uh, they just look at light coming out from the, the, the MOS2 and the metal contacts. Basically, this is a shocking barrier effect. Because of this shocking barrier, you know, we can see two things, right? It's a hard, it, you cannot realize these ambipolar injections, and also it's bad contact. So the efficiency for current generation is really low. I'll give you a number. So basically, you need a 10 microamp in order to see any light coming out from a sample. Now we have these PN junctions, and we can realize these ambipolar injections. So we expect that there's a um, more efficient light emission or electroluminescence from a sample. So here's uh, the, the, the data. And uh, the bottom left is uh, the optical microscope image. And here I show you the luminescence image. So these two white bars are corresponding to electrodes, and the, the white stri stripe in the middle corresponding to the electroluminescence. So here I'm sending, you know, I'm sending a forward bias across the sample, across the PN junction. Then the light will just come out from the center of the device, means it's the PN junction. So now we can tell with this PN junction, actually we have a pretty strong light coming out. So we want to look at the nature of these, uh, these electroluminescence. This is uh, the data we take at, uh, at the room temperature. And the black dot showing you is electroluminescence. And uh, the red curve here showing you photoluminescence. So once we plot them together, we can see actually this electroluminescence is coming from the excitons. And then we check this luminescence as function bias. Basically, we can see even with about the, you know, close to 100 picoamp, we, can, we already see very strong luminescence coming out. Compared to previous MS2, they need about 10 microamp. So we can see there's a dramatic increase of the efficiency of this electroluminescence of device. And then we want to look more close, we, we want to take a more close look on, on, on the nature of this uh, electroluminescence. So we cool down the device, and uh, here I show you electroluminescence map as function of a current in the y-axis and the horizontal axis in the energy. So here I want to show you there's four features. The first one is this one, there's a narrow feature, and then here is a shoulder, and there's a broad peak in the middle, and there's another shoulder in the high energy side. I compare this electroluminescence map 
with this photoluminescence map, as I show you here. Okay, this is now just by compare compare these photoluminescence to the electroluminescence, we can clearly see what's going on, right? This sharp line here, electroluminescence, actually coming from this neutral exciton. And uh, this little shoulder here is coming from this guy, X plus. And then uh, the broad feature in the middle coming from the negatively charged triangles. And then the shoulder on the lower end side coming from these impurity bounded excitons. So I selectively plot the spectrums of these electroluminescence as a function of uh, inject current injections. At the low current injections, we see two features, impurity bounded exciton and uh, negatively charged excitons. Once I start to increase my current injection, basically I start to populate my, the extonic levels. Then I start to see X plus show up at the shoulder here. And uh, then at the end, when I inject a lot of current, I start to see exciton because the exciton, neutral exciton here, is the high, at the highest energies. So what I have here, you know, at the first part of my talk, I showed you, right, all these neutral exciton or charged excitons, actually they are valley excitons. They are exciton localized at the corner brain zones. So by comparing these two maps, basically we know all these electroluminescence actually they come in from the valley excitons. Okay? So this is a slightly different from the conventional LED we know. They're coming from the exciton at the gamma point, which is center of brain zone. Now we know for these small semiconductors, we can have electroluminescence coming from the valley excitons. So this, there's important implications. Means in the future, if we can do spin polarized injections, okay? If we do spin polarized injection means we can selectively populate particular valleys, then we can have spin or valley polarized LEDs. So that's something we, we're trying to do now. Okay, so this is uh, my, summa my summaries. What I want to show you is I want to do a little comparison between MOS2, MOSC2, and the tungsten selenide. Because in the community, right, uh, there's a lot, a lot of papers on MOS2. But I would like to argue for optical studies. Actually, MOSE2 or tungsten selenide actually is slightly better. So here's a spectra I show you for MOS2 and MOSE2 in the same energy spans. Okay, and uh, they are also taking the same condition, means same temperature, same integration time, same laser power. You can clearly see the difference, right? First, for MOSE2, we can clearly resolve the neutral exciton and the charged exciton. I know they are pretty narrow, but for MOS2. Well, the, they, they, the signal is not as strong and also much broader. It's actually 10 times broader. The, here, the, the blue curve, I show you the tungsten selenide. So tungsten selenide is also narrow compared to MOS2. And uh, here's the summary. What I have is comparing, comparing the line width for both MOS2 or tungsten diselenide, the, the line width is narrower, about 10 times. And also we know for MOS2, the, for current sample reported in the literature, always uh, initially there's a negative doping. But for MOS2 or tungsten diselenide, we know it's almost starting with nearly intrinsic, so it means less, less impurities. And we show there's a very clear tunable acetonic charging effect for both MOS2 MOS and uh, tungsten, tungsten diselenide. And for MOS2, we know it's hard to do because uh, it's really hard to realize uh, whole doping. And the other very important thing for optical study is the energies for MYC2 and for tungsten selenide, actually, they, they are within the TASFI laser spectrums. They are all above 700 nanometers, so between 700 and 800 nanometers. So this is very important. It means we can u utilize all these uh, is existing TASFI lasers to study or select optical you know, frequency selective address of these uh, valley excitons. For MOS2, we know it's uh, about 1.8 EV. Actually, it's a six, <coughs> six, 640, 650 nanometer. So it's just above the types of laser technologies, OK? So it seems I still have time, right? No? Yeah, yeah. This is my summary, but since I have time, I want to show you one more thing. I just throw them together. Actually, it's not really organized, but I think it's interesting to share with you. So we're also trying to, you know, for the optoelectronic device, we want to study the ultimate goal is to see if we can do these uh, both Einstein condensations using this MOS2 system. But the first thing to do is uh, can we realize these uh, strong interactions? So what we did is we, 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 we fabricated these uh, photonic crystal cavities. Then we transferred these uh, monolayer constant selenide on top of these photonic, photonic crystal cavities. 
okay? And I want to see how, how the interaction between these two kind of photonic systems. So the bottom here is figure D shows the monolayer trans this is optical microscope image. So the square in the middle is a photonic crystal and with its cavity. And uh, the, in the middle here, you know, it, SE, you can look at this SEM image is it's the monolayer tungsten cyanide. So the photonic crystal cavity, actually it's a defect cavity, O3 cavity is in the middle. And uh, then we look at uh, these uh, spatial resolved luminescence measurements. So here, you know, we basically scan a laser, then we measure luminescence as function of positions. So you can clearly see luminescence very strong in the middle here, on top, on top, of, this photonic, on top of this photonic crystal. And uh, here I, I, I plot the three positions. You can see the green dots, red dots, and black dots. I show the spectra here. So this spectra is different, right? When the outside this photonic crystal, is, the signal is weak. And uh, on top of the photonic crystal, actually, there's a, the signal is greatly enhanced. And this enhancement actually coming from the suspension effect. We, we basically do control measurements. Has nothing to do with photonic crystal balance structures, but it's coming from the suspensions. And then in the middle, we have the strong narrow peak here. So this narrow peak is coming from the photonic crystal cavity. Basically, this shows there's a coupling between these uh, excitons and uh, to a photonic crystal cavity mode. And then we can also you know, do spatial mapping of these sharp peaks. Basically, then we see this sharp peak actually really coming from the center, basically coupling to the photonic crystal cavities. We can fabricate different photonic cr crystal cavities, and then we can shift the cavity mode. Once we shift to the cavity mode, we can see the PL also shift follow the photonic crystal cavity. So this is a demonstration. So what's interesting is, now we look at uh, the momentum distributions of these photons. And uh, first of all, let's look at the, the, we do momentum resolve measurements, okay? So in the momentum resolve measurements, what we have is when the, when the sample is off the photonic crystal cavity, we see these, you know, kind of uh, uniform distributions. This is uh, just uh, normal. But if we look at the, the photon coming from the photonic crystal, actually now it has a very clear, the photons actually, the, the direction of emission is strongly modulated. We see a ring here. So this is uh, coming from the interference effect. Basically, this, the emitting light is on the order of 800 nanometer, but the photonic crystal cavity lattice is on the order of 100 nanometer. So there's a strong interference effect coming from light. Depends on the crystal lattice of these photonic crystals and uh, the pattern of emission can be mo modulated. For this particular case, we can, this is sort of an optical antenna feature, right? We have the ring here. If we fabricate a different type of photonic crystal cavity, what we have is we change the patterns, we can have this more complicated pattern. The, the right hand here is uh, theoretical simulations, and the left bottom is the measurements. Okay. So I think the, the first result is pretty promising. Basically, we can show the coupling between the two-dimensional exciton to the cavity mode, and we can use photonic crystal cavity to direct the photon emission from these small semiconductors. But this cavity actually has really low Q. It's not trivial to fabricate high Q at these wavelengths. So the next thing we want to do is we want to fabricate high Q and see if we can realize there's a strong coupling between excitons and the cavity mode. And this will be the end of my talk. <laughs>